Obviously, so much going on in the world of crypto besides the price rise um, for Bitcoin specifically. The big event in the last few weeks has been the sort of fascination and interest with uh, Facebook Libra. And I'm curious how you think that does or doesn't have an impact on the existing world of cryptocurrencies. Uh, th thanks for having me on. Um, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the announcement of uh, Libra and the Libra Association, as I said, we, we view it as a very massive inflection point, and I think it has an impact uh, across the board. Um, you know, first, just general awareness all around the world around cryptocurrency. It's going to bring this uh, into the limelight. It's going to help. Uh, you know, individuals and businesses that are interested in this, um, you know, obviously have dramatically more visibility. And ultimately, we think it's going to help ensure that, um, you know, billions of people ultimately are able to access the benefits of cryptocurrency within uh, the financial system. So we think it's huge in terms of awareness. Um, I, I think it also is important in terms of um, ultimately regulatory questions and, you know, figuring out exactly how right. crypto finance companies more broadly are going to work uh, in, in this new realm. Well, Jeremy, what about the logistics of getting it done? I mean, do, when do you think we'll actually see this? And I'm also wondering, do you think that this would have been a better idea, logistically speaking, if it had come from someone other than Facebook? Well, I, I think, um, you know, the, the first thing to realize is that, you know, blockchains, you know, public blockchains that are capable of supporting hundreds of millions to billions of users with kind of mainstream applications in finance, those are really just emerging. We're sort of, we went through the first generation of blockchains with Bitcoin. Uh, many would say sort of Ethereum and similar chains represent kind of the second generation of blockchains. And those today support tens of millions of users and growing. Um, but there's really been this effort all around the world by you know, computer scientists and designers and economists to design these sort of third generation blockchains, which ultimately can provide the features and scalability needed to kind of blanket the world with the benefits of crypto. And the, the, the project that Facebook is introducing with a number of other you know, companies is just is one take at that, but it's not the only take. Uh, uh, but I think the consortium model is absolutely the right model around any kind of new technical standards that we're trying to see uh, develop in crypto finance. Jeremy, you say, you've said a couple of times the benefits of crypto. One of the benefits of crypto that a lot of people would cite is decentralization, censorship-free transactions, being able to buy anything without any middleman saying you can't do that. Of course, you, Circle has its own stable coin. It's fiat-backed, it's regulated. Facebook's is going to be fiat-backed and regulated. What is the uh, benefit of a crypto that doesn't really offer that uh, censorship-free transactions because it has to go through on some level or interface with the existing financial system? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, we look at all of this kind of on a spectrum. Um, our view is that um, you are going to have mass adoption of uh, non-sovereign kind of store of value digital assets. I think Bitcoin is sort of the preeminent asset there. And the need and desire for those kinds of assets is going to grow, not diminish. You're also going to see growth in these stablecoin type assets that, um, are, you know, very likely will have you know regulatory frameworks around them. But right. um, there's there's but there is a really key difference between stablecoins that run on kind of closed loop permission schemes, which is how Libra is being proposed today, at least in its initial incarnation, versus stablecoins that can run on the public internet. And that's really the model that Coinbase and Circle have developed together through the Center Consortium. That's how US dollar coin works today and is growing in its usage. And so there really are some variances in how people are going to be implementing these different types of currency models. Uh, so when you talk about the regulation, though, and particularly uh, creating national policy and potentially what I would assume some sort of integrated international policy, how do we actually get there in this environment, particularly when there's still a lot of concerns uh, about uh, security, about the concentration of ownership of bitcoins, and, of course, a lot of speculation about whether there's market manipulation? Yeah. So, I mean, I think these have all been um, topics that have been, you know, explored, and now I think there's even more attention on it. Um, the policy issues range from, you know, what are the standards for things like um, pr protecting, you know, f from the abuse by criminals or kind of financial crimes type risk? 
or uh, you know what are the risks um, you know associated with the theft of digital assets, uh, essentially the custody of these types of digital assets by intermediaries. We we haven't yet really seen any rules around that um, in any broad-based sense. And then finally, and probably most importantly, is. A lot of the really exciting uses of crypto are in, you know, innovations in how people raise capital and how people create kind of financial contracts um, using this, and so the kind of standardization of the financial instrument side of this. Um, so there's there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done still. There's sort of been regulation by enforcement or kind of regulation, uh, you know, in, on an ad hoc basis. And what we've been advocating for, and I hope uh, in some ways the introduction of Libra brings this forward, is. The, the development of national policy around digital assets. Um, mm. Our view is that you know crypto and blockchains represent sort of the fabric of the 21st century, uh, 21st century economy, and there's an opportunity to put in place policy that allows this to flourish on a massive scale in the same way that the internet flourished in the mid to late 90s, and policy was really vital to enabling that to happen. So far, policy has been mostly focused on the downside or the risks. Um, what we really need to be focused on is, yes, we need to manage risk, but also how do we open this up so that far, far more companies can benefit from it, and, uh, and, and hopefully we'll see more of that in the coming years. Jeremy, real quickly, uh, what is the dominant use case currently for your stable coin, the USD coin? So U.S. dollar coin, um, we introduced it in uh, Q4 of last year, um, and so it is, a, as you noted, it's a dollar-backed uh, cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. The primary use today is as a payment and settlement method within the digital asset markets. So the digital asset markets are these multi-billion dollar markets that exist all around the world where people are trading, investing uh, in digital assets. And so having a, a dollar uh, that can move at the speed of the internet, that can move with you know, incredibly low cost, and that can be where the transaction can be settled with a counterparty in minutes securely, is really powerful, especially if you're trying to operate in that digital asset marketplace. So that's been the primary use case. We obviously believe that the uses of this are going to really proliferate, ultimately to the point where you know, payments and moving value is just a free service on the internet, and people are using these to access a very broad range of kind of financial products from their mobile phones all around the world.